yes good afternoon again uh, i was just trying to introduce today's uh, webinar on uh, simulation for transforming medical education and we are happy to co collaborate this with uh, uh, sat uh, in based in <clears throat> india through professor arindam kaur and i'm happy to share that uh, this is a joint sort of our venture between our colleagues in india most of them uh, but two of them are in UK, but then uh, they have agreed to be the speakers on this uh, webinar forum. And very happy to have you here. I'd like to uh, welcome Honorable President, Register Madam, and my colleagues, faculties and deans, <clears throat> and maybe some of the students and medical officers across the country. This simulation-based uh, training is uh, it's quietly new in Bhutan, but uh, we have taken more seriously with uh, considering the quality of medical education, patient safety, and also with the ongoing COVID, that's very difficult to get face-to-face -face and elective postings. But I think this is a serious concern across the globe that uh, we need to take something, some innovation for medical education. That's why the transforming medical education through simulation has been taken seriously. And happy to share with you, our colleagues, that uh, this is a project that uh, the uh, uh, partners in Japan through JICA is supporting this uh, uh, project as well. And uh, we will be happy to continue collaboration with you. So without much uh, delay, I'd like to just uh, share the speakers here. Although Professor Saikat will be uh, introducing other speakers, but to share Professor Saikat. Professor Saikat is anesthesiologist, is the senior consultant in Glen Eagle Hospital based in Kolkata. And uh, he is also a chairperson, chairman in the anesthesia uh, academy in, based in Kolkata. So just to briefly introduce himself. And now with this, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Saikat uh, to take this uh, webinar forward. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, uh, Dr. Tashi, for those kind words. It's a pleasure and privilege. And uh, at the outset, this is one of the countries that I have really enjoyed being in. So it was a uh, kind of an honor when uh, I was asked that, would I be happy to be part of this webinar? So uh, what uh, what my role would be that uh, I would just kind of introduce this uh, thing to you. And uh, the role of uh, simulation in medical education and Dr. Tashi uh, already kind of mentioned that it is uh, topical because of the COVID pandemic and even without the COVID pandemic, uh, the role of simulation in medical education is really, really huge. And uh, so what is uh, simulation? Uh, I, I quite like this uh, definition that was given by Gawa. Uh, it is a technique and not necessarily a technology. I think this is something that needs to get in. And uh, well, I do not possibly like that word to replace, but I quite like the word that it amplifies the real experiences with guided experiences that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of the real world in a fully interactive manner. So what it is trying to do, it is kind of try to uh, take you, what simulation can do is it has this ability to take you through different uh, scenarios to different situations and uh, there's a huge amount of interaction that goes along with simulation and you will get a feel a pulse of what it is if you already know it fine but uh, our faculty today will take it take you through this so it is an educational technique everybody agrees to this it came in from the aviation industry it came in from the nuclear industry big time into medical uh, teaching, medical education. It allows interactive and it is times immersive. So what you do now uh, translates to what you will do later on. What you have done in the past can be replicated again right now and change possibly the way you possibly behave or uh, do things and do it for the better. 
Uh, you can re recreate nearly, nearly all kinds of clinical experience, and uh, you will get a hang of it uh, from many of the other speakers as well. What kind of levels you can go to, and I think where it stands out uh, versus bedside teaching versus teaching in the OR, teaching in the A and E, teaching in the surgical room, uh, whatever is it will not expose patients to associated risks. And I think people who are into uh, surgery, uh, like uh, even when you're kind of training or teaching your uh, trainees how to put a clip on the uh, cystic duct, you are always worried whether the clip actually goes into the cystic duct and goes no, not to the common bile duct. But in a simulated scenario, you are not worried about this injury that can happen to the patient. I think this is where I think simulation has a huge, huge uh, advantage over conventional approaches. Uh, what are the key elements? It is an educational activity, and that is where it is main forte is. It is hugely interactive, is experiential, and I think uh, when you're talking about adult learning, it is about reinforcement of experiences that we all kind of know. So people can go through uh, uh, this uh, kind of sequence of activities and experience uh, things at various levels and it helps them to remember and then when you go and do it again and you'll hear about something uh, repeatedly today with about debriefing and you that this experience comes back again and again to you and so it reinforces it, it, it can mimic nearly all real life activity as realistically as possible and therein uh, herein, I think you will hear it again from our faculty that it, it is not about gadgets, it's not about gizmos, it is about how the faculty who teaches on the simulation labs or whatever, how they are able to design their uh, uh, project, how they are able to uh, kind of design this uh, kind of experiences and to mimic as close as possible to the real life and using small uh, gadgets uh, small things uh, which can make it as realistic as possible, like an IV stand, IV fluids, and you can run it. You don't need very high fidelity simulators, but you can still do it initially with uh, smaller things. But again, I, I think this is will be reinforced again and again that it does not it uh, avoids the risk of exposing patients to undue risk, and that is the huge thing about simulation. Uh, how? Can it be used to help? And this is, I think, from Dr. Tashi uh, that I was uh, able to gather when you were, we were talking a few days back and even yet today morning, is that uh, the, the, if can it be incorporated into the medical curriculum? The answer is big yes. And I think Dr. Manisha, uh, Dr. Rakesh, and Dr. Rahul will talk about this. And it's been already into the curriculum big time in the UK, US, and many places in the West. Uh, uh, is come uh, even in the All India Institute, there where Dr. Rakesh comes from. You'll talk about how they have incorporated into their teachings uh, academics. So it has to be incorporated. Uh, uh, we, we will discuss how and how, where to and how to get what equipments initially and how, how to step it up. Uh, very very important would be the training of the faculty and uh, how you are going to manage that you will uh, kind of decide uh, big time as to the success of the program. Uh, of course, you will need uh, local support, the support of your uh, university, the support of your government, the uh, management of your hospitals, because it, it comes at a price, it, come, it takes space, and uh, it is a little, for those uninitiated, it at times feels that, uh, well, uh, what is the point? But uh, it, it, it has been seen that it can be really, really helpful. And uh, it does work. There is enough, enough evidence. I possibly just quoted one of them. Uh, skills learned in the simulation center are, yes, transferable to the real clinical environment. Not only transferable, they're transferable to enhance, to be improve, to, uh, to better the the clinical skills so not only do you teach people on simulation love the simple technical skills i think people who have done laparoscopy the, that black box that you have used for suturing was one of the first things that people possibly thought about uh, suturing 
you had the intubating mannequins where you intubated that you have to delivering a baby mannequins uh, that is all good you you learn how to put in a central venous axis maybe how to put in a chest drain and uh, stuff like that and uh, recognize certain uh, 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 clinical parameters but this is where i think uh, in my opinion simulation uh, really really helps is it's uh, clinical work is a huge team work it's not about one individual doing it and uh, the success uh, in acute care mainly as well as in chronic care is how the team functions during a crisis uh, so this is where uh, simulation teaches you about communication how uh, the leader communicates with the other people in that team how the chief surgeon uh, communicates with his assistant uh, with the anesthesiologist somebody in intensive care how that person is communicating with possibly a nursing staff with possibly another consultant uh, 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 during a period of crisis in the a and e the uh, the the maybe the, uh, the 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 award boy or whoever is picking up something how he is communicating to uh, maybe a doctor who is there and then uh, how you are getting in people to help in that role i think this is something when you are doing role play in simulation it teaches you uh, easily much easily than in uh, possibly in real life you cannot change but in the uh, in, in simulated scenarios you see how people are doing it and it can help decision making leadership huge huge amount of role that that you can have and you will get a hang of this as we proceed with time so uh, not only psychomotor but cognitive skills as well so another part is uh, i think this is what dr tashi uh, has been uh, quite very much interested about is how can we assess maybe an, uh, conduct an examination with the help of a simulator or with simulations yes it can be done as long as you have defined and then you have re uh, developed reliable and valid measurement tools we will go through it and this is something which you can think about later on and uh, it has been well validated and uh, that uh, if you have this assessment scores which are valid and reliable you can do it but i think uh, that is something that you can look forward to in the future so what we will do today and uh, this is where i would uh, kind of uh, end that we will first figure out that how you can set up a simulation based education program dr manisha is here she she has huge experience on this she has herself set it up uh, she will talk about it we have dr rakesh garg from the all india institute uh, delhi uh, she, he will talk about what simulators can be used the types and uh, also there are certain uh, uh, very very uh, small things which can be done locally uh, and uh, you will hear about it from him and uh, this role in communication that i was talking about i think dr rahul will take you through this and it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce the faculty uh, you've already know dr tashi it is superfluous for me to introduce dr tashi to you uh, uh, consultant general surgeon and neurosurgeon at jwnr hospital uh, professor of surgery and the dean in the faculty of postgraduate medicine at the kg university of bhutan uh, uh, our, our privilege to have had him uh, for a long long time in uh, the uh, with the armed forces where he i think graduated from and post graduated also uh, dr manisha shah uh, i think she grew up in ahmedabad if i am not mistaken and now stays in the uk she is a consultant and anesthetist with special interest in prehabilitation so people who are used to enhance recovery after surgery would understand how important it is to be a co-lead of pre uh, prehabilitation services at the medway and hs foundation trust in the uk she has been leading the simulation program for a long long time and uh, it's it's only appropriate that she will take you through how to set it up and incorporate it into medical curriculum uh, her interest being uh, measuring the impact of educational intervention on patient safety welcome dr manisha uh, 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 before you take over manisha uh, dr manisha i'll just introduce the rest of the faculty if it is okay with you uh, dr rakesh uh, well uh, it's a pleasure to introduce dr rakesh 
but it's also a big job to introduce Dr. Rakesh because it takes more than a slide to introduce him. And you have to reduce the font size to put in his credentials as well. So Dr. Rakesh Garg uh, did his MD DNB over here. He's the fellow of the Indian College of Anesthesia. Uh, he's, he's got a fellowship in palliative medicine. Currently, he's the additional professor of anesthesiology, critical care, pain, and palliative medicine. Uh, the Department of Onco-Anesthesiology and Palliative Medicine at uh, uh, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He is an associated, uh, this has got a mind of its own, it's moving on its own, uh, associated editor of two of the uh, big journals in India, the Indian Journal of Anesthesia and the JOSAP, the Journal of Anesthesia Clinical Pharmacology. His special interests are in research, teaching and training, and medical education. And uh, a fellow Bengali in the midst of all this, Dr. Rahul Dev Sharkar, uh, is an MRCP with, and an MRCP in respiratory medicine uh, uh, with an Euro European diploma in intensive care. He's a consultant physician in respiratory medicine and critical care in the same trust as Dr. Manisha is in the Medway NHS Foundation Trust. He's a regional advisor for the Faculty of Intensive Care, and uh, his interests are in public health and prediction models. And he loves teaching and having direct contact with his patients. So please welcome Dr. Manisha, Dr. Garg, and Dr. Rahul Dev, and uh, Dr. Tashi is always there to be co uh, coordinate everything. And I'll also be there uh, all the while with but the T-shirt of Bhutan proudly on my chest. So if it is all right, Dr. Manisha, can you please take over and let's get this rolling. Thank you, Dr. Sangupta, and thank you, Dr. Tashi, for inviting me for this webinar. Um, I'm going to present uh, about how to set up a simulation-based education program. Actually, it is my journey. I work at Medway NHS Foundation Trust in southeast of uh, England in Kent. And I was appointed as a simulation ba uh, based education lead uh, about 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago. And this, what I'm going to present is my own journey. There may be some errors which I, mis I made, some mistakes I made, and I'm going to highlight them. So when you're starting new, you can avoid them. Uh, I think Dr. Sen Gupta has already uh, covered this one, so I'm not going to spend more time on uh, about simulation. One thing I want to uh, uh, emphasize is simulation is not a replacement for clinical practice. It enhances clinical practice, and sometimes it fills in a gap when there are very rare events which are very unlikely uh, as a junior doctor or junior nurse to experience. So it fills in those gaps. It creates those mental models for uh, very junior uh, healthcare professionals and help them make decisions in future. But it is a, a addition to clinical experience, not instead of clinical experience. I think Dr. Um, Sankupta has already highlighted the concepts about how adults learn and how simulation is a perfect method of education for uh, adult, um, you know, healthcare professionals. Uh, one thing I want to highlight for this cycle of experiential learning is reflective observation. And it just emphasizes the role of debrief for any adult to learn uh, through simulation. And I think I'll come back to debrief later when we talk about faculty um, uh, development. The next one is deliberate practice. I really like this uh, concept where you have a very clearly defined objective, like simulation learning objective, uh, and you have immediate feedback or debrief, and you have a repetition of the same scenario, same experience, but with increasing uh, challenge or increasing difficulty. Um, and this, the aim of this uh, repeated experience is to improve performance. And I think of this, this theory is used for athletes, for swimmers, golfers, musicians, 
And I think it is absolutely true for healthcare professionals as well. Uh, so what, what are the, um, the, the different guidance I had available when I started as a simulation lead? The national strategy UK is one of the leader in simulation-based education and has the highest number of high uh, fidelity simulators uh, in um, uh, Europe. And I mean, I like from these three words I'm going to emphasize is equity of access. And it is for everybody. And it, it, the aim is to deliver high quality out educational outcome to deliver patient-centered care, the safe care for patients. That is the outcome of simulation. So we, are, we, we invest so much in faculty development on all the simulators. The ultimate aim for us is to, to ensure that we deliver a very high quality uh, care. So this is, I'm going to start my story. So when I was appointed, I had like a very small team, team of three people. And we started thinking that, okay, yes, we have got this new faculty. We sat under medical education. We had allocated budget and we, we had to decide what we are going to use it for, who will benefit, how we are going to run, what we are going to teach. And next few slides is our, uh, the, the, the outcome of those discussions. So basically we decided that, yes, we wanted to apply simulation or make simulation-based education available to everyone, to doctors, nurses, and all allied health professionals. But this is where I made my first mistake. When we discussed the funding, I did not negotiate the funding for simulation to include nurses and allied health professionals. To do it retrospectively, once you're running and once you have running like 50 courses and then going back, to hospital management to ask for money is a mistake. You need to put that in your business plan from day one. And you need to account for all the costs of having nurses, backfilling nurses, when they are taken out of their clinical area, allied health professionals. Um, the UK position is there is lots of money for medical education, but that is very little money available for any other paramedical professionals. And that's where uh, I think I had to struggle to get funding later on. So what we wanted to teach, okay, yes, simulation is very obvious. You can teach central line insertion, you can teach chest drain insertion, you can teach endoscopy or difficult intubations on uh, tra task trainers, you can, uh, teach also knowledge-based scenarios where there is, they are very, very heavily protocol-based management, rare events like a failure to intubate and failure to oxygenate, or uh, the, the uh, conditions where uh, there is a very, the, the time-limited decisions are extremely important for patient outcomes. So simulation has got a really good place for that. The other areas, non-technical skills, like so uh, other areas which we wanted to cover is like human factors yeah. and ergonomics, like looking at the safe design for systems, uh, decision making, situation awareness, teamwork, communication, fixations. Uh, we also wanted to include the, some of the scenarios based on behaviors, attitudes, and professionalism. And we also wanted to include system safety, checking systems. I mean, one of the examples is that we recently opened a new pediatric uh, emergency department, and we tested it by uh, running uh, simulation scenarios for difficult uh, uh, cases on the day one to just ensure where the system was failing. has to be multidisciplinary. I have already mentioned that, that we want to include everybody. And we currently we have uh, doctors, nurses, midwives, physiotherapists as regular participants in simulations. We have some courses running for radiographers. Um, we sometimes have paramedics and occasionally we have police as well as a part of domestic abuse scenarios. 
I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the outcome of those discussions. Um, we had a strategy that how we are going to reach to the point where we wanted to reach. And there are some of the points which I've highlighted on this screen, which I'm going to discuss in detail. And first one is faculty and personnel. Faculty, I think it's the most important aspect. I cannot emphasize enough. Faculty development is the best investment you will ever have. And having a good faculty will ensure success of your program. So what are the personnel you need in simulation? You need faculty, you need technical expert, you need someone who can do makeup for um, humans and for mannequins. You need a manager and admin staff to look after the whole of the unit. And you need a strategic lead with a vision. So now I'm going to focus on faculty development. As I previously mentioned, it is the best investment you will have and best return on investment as well. Uh, you need to calculate that how many faculty you will need based on your prediction of the how many courses and what sort of uh, uh, audience you're going to pitch to. So basically, if two to three faculty for immediate to high fidelity simulation is a, is a start. Uh, you need one faculty for scheme training. That's minimal. Uh, now, um, basically, now if you say have 10 or 15 people in skills training, one person may not be enough. Or uh, uh, if you have, uh, sometimes we run a uh, simulation which is we call as hybrid simulation where we include skills training as well as continuously running scenarios. And for those uh, kind of uh, very high level, high fidelity simulation, you may need more faculty. So this is quite resource having uh, education method. It is not cheap. It is expensive. Now, what sort of knowledge you need to build up? For your faculty uh, obviously they will have clinical background they will have clinical knowledge but on top of that clinical knowledge they will need some educational background so they will need some engagement with the, some teaching and training understanding the uh, principles of adult education they need to understand scenario writing and they need to be able to map those scenarios with curriculum there's no point in running a scenario which is not going to be useful to any of the participants. Now, curriculum mapping. Curriculum is not just one curriculum coming from, like, the College of Anesthesia or College of Surgery. There are lots of different. In UK, we are driven by uh, GMC Good Practice Guidance. So we run those, uh, those aspects. We include them in uh, our uh, curriculum mapping for scenarios. We have Royal Colleges curriculum. We also have our local needs, like local SIs and local need assessment. And we write scenario based on that. So it's a very wide topic. It is not just one area we, you will need to look at. You need to look at I mean, a wide range of different resources available. Obviously, debriefing skill, that's the most important skill faculty will need. Debriefing is not feedback. It is quite different. It's a much higher level skill than feedback. And it has certain amount of learning curve. Uh, just by attending one course, I think faculty is not going to be expert. You need to support them through their journey from novice faculty to the skill faculty level. At uh, Medway, we run a one day uh, debriefing course for train the kind of train the trainer course for faculty. And then we invite them to debrief medical student simulation, the basic multidisciplinary simulation, which is intermediate fidelity one. They are supported by senior faculty and they run five courses and each debriefing is has a feedback for faculty. And this faculty keep a booklet. We have our booklet, which is uh, the share, uh, kept on the shared drive. And 
the we, we chart their progress. And then after medical students, they go to foundation level simulation and gradually they start running uh, independently high fidelity simulation. Uh, and it's, it is a slow process and it, it is a, a you know, quite intense, resource heavy process, but benefits are enormous. If you uh, uh, be brief, our faculty has the responsibility of ensuring the safe learning environment. They need to ensure the psychological safety of the participants. So it's very important. You can't just let, let anybody lose on those participants. You need to have the, the faculty with those skills, debriefing skills. The other knowledge and skills faculty need uh, are human factors and ergonomics. We also run one day human factors course for faculty. So faculty, any novice faculty is mandatory that they attend those two days, debriefing day and human factors day before they are allowed to debrief any 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 uh, simulation. And basic understanding of educational research, how to read the research, how to re understand the outcome and uh, uh, a recommendation. I think this is also important, enthusiasm and engagement. Initially, I had some of the faculty members who joined simulation because they felt that it was easy day away from a, um, a clinical area, nice, light, fun day. It is not so. Simulation is hard work and we need flu, full engagement and full enthusiasm for education and for simulation. So you need to be sure that the faculty will be able to engage and able to contribute. They are not coming there because they get those free days there. This is also as a, a simulation lead or simulate the developer. You have to take into account is faculty time. Don't rely on people's goodwill. That was my second mistake. Uh, you have to negotiate job plan time for faculty. If you think that, okay, Rahul uh, or Dr. Sarkar will come today and debrief, he may be busy in clinical area, uh, but if his job plan, if those four hours are specially assigned for simulation-based education, he will come. So it's, it's extremely important to plan this funding for job planning faculty. And I'm talking about multidisciplinary, same for doctors, nursing, and allied health profession. All of them has to be job planned. So you can ensure the faculty availability for your courses. Um, the faculty training has to be a rolling program because you need to account for faculty attrition. Because some people may not enjoy it later on, or they take on some other responsibility, and then they give up faculty, simulation faculty role. So this program has to be continuous. At Medway, we run four days per year for debriefing courses and four days per year for um, uh, human factors. And we have, on average, 10 people on course. Out of those 10 people, maybe two or three will actually really engage and volunteer to be part of faculty. So this, this is not easy process. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of patience and a lot of hard work to to gradually build up the faculty pool. And you have to provide for continuous professional development of fa existing faculty. Uh, uh, you need to have some funding available for them to attend courses, then for them to attend uh, or uh, present their uh, work, their publications. So all those things, all those support has to be inbuilt into the program. Uh, the other skills. Basic understanding of finances and how to write a business case. I had to have a very quick learning curve because all simulation-based activity and funding is by competitive commissioning in UK. So for any money I want, I have to write a business case and I have to put that a bid. And it was, uh, um, the, I was not taught this in medical school. I was not taught during my postgraduate uh, uh, graduate postgraduate uh, education. This is something separate, and there are some really good online courses available in NHS. And possibly, when you're looking at your development, I think you need to 
provides uh, this support to faculty because that's what will happen for future. <coughs> it comes to accreditation. If faculty has done all these things, they are they are being competent, then the, it comes accreditation. Now nationally, there are some plans to provide this uh, accreditation process, but it is not widely adopted yet. But uh, locally, we keep this uh, booklet and CPD diary for each faculty, and it is up updated once every two years. Now, coming to other uh, resource, don't forget your standardized patients and their training. Any simulation program will be weak if you don't have involvement of end users. So it's extremely, extremely important to have uh, those end users involved in developing scenarios as well as development of the service. And some of them will volunteer to be a standardized uh, uh, patients. They need some training and how to give feedback. They do not participate in debriefing, but they give feedback about uh, the, the, the treatment and the, the communication from doctors and things like that. We do have a such program in our neighboring university at Christchurch University. They run this program to train standardized patients. You have to account for the funding for that as well. Uh, then the next thing is uh, we need a, a framework, a, a, a arch of guidance under which we work. So we provide quality education. And one of the associations which has provided the national guidance uh, is Association of Simulator Practice in Healthcare. It's a UK-based body. And they work with Royal Colleges, work with Health Education England, and they provide this uh, uh, framework. And they have got, uh, I, I would encourage you to look at this uh, guidance because they, they have got quite comprehensive quality standards for faculty, for technical health, for activities, so your SNAP program uh, and, and other things like facilities and resources. Now I'm coming to the resources, the other, other rooms. Uh, I think uh, uh, probably it will be covered with the mannequins, but my advice is keep your rooms multipurpose. I've just put these pictures because the top one is a GP's consultation room. But the same room, we have this uh, screen printed uh, banner, which we put up and it becomes home from home room for home deliveries, for paramedic training. So uh, neck of femur, we run a scenario at home, uh, patient is at home, has developed neck of femur fracture and uh, paramedics come and uh, how they are going to deal with this patient. So this room is a multipurpose room and each room in our center ha is a multipurpose room because it is, you, you're not going to get unlimited number of rooms and you need to be able to use them in for the different types of scenarios and different training. Uh, this is my third mistake. You have to plan. Simulation grows exponentially. I, when I started, I had around uh, 11 sessions initially. Now we are running 350 sessions in a year and whatever space we have is not enough. Sometimes we have to compromise or we have to run parallel sessions in, uh, in um, uh, uh, you know, boards and in uh, 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 simulators or in skills room, but we are really struggling with, the, with, uh, with uh, our space. I'm just going to go back. The one thing I also wanted to highlight is don't forget your office space. Now, faculty and participants are going to spend the whole day here. So don't forget the refreshment facilities, water fountain, toilets, all those things should be, you should be planning that. We don't have a water fire fountain in our simulation center. We have to walk like to the other part, area of the wall, uh, other area of the building to get water. So it is a drawback. I think when we plan again, we design, I'm going, I have learned from my mistake and I'm going to include all those things. So that, I'm not going to uh, dwell on to the simulators because we have the whole talk on it. But these are some of our uh, simulators. The one 
one thing I want to emphasize is the think outside box. Uh, make your own uh, simulator. Use animal tissue. And I've just highlighted this one, one poster from uh, one of the children hospital in U.S. They make their cannulation uh, arm with uh, silicone. Uh, 3D printing is also very useful. We have uh, the software for 3D printing a front of neck access simulator. There are quite a lot of different simulators and those uh, our software are free, available for public use. And I think if you go on to the 3D Printers Association in UK, they have this uh, um, uh, this uh, resource available. It is freely available in, uh, on internet anyway. Way forward, I would say, is VR. Uh, you need less faculty. You need less space. People can access it from their home. Uh, it has much wider application than any skill trainer or high fidelity simulator but they have limitations as well. VR at this current stage is not useful for very complex communication scenarios and very complex psychomotor uh, skills training. The other resource, don't forget games. This is our uh, ED game. It's commercially available. It was developed by one of the ED trainee at Brighton uh, and it's marketed by hospital. They are very expensive. So my advice is make your own games. We have our own locally developed as bar game. Uh, and we use quite a lot of children toys as well to highlight uh, some of the non-technical aspects of simulation training. And when you have, take them away from clinical uh, scenario, they have to work hard to crystallize those concepts of what they learn from those non-clinical games into the clinical understanding. But once it's crystallized, it sticks very well. So it is extremely efficient way of training. We use Tengram, Chinese Tengram for a communication game. We use Zoom book for team working. We have balls game, which uh, we you have colorful balls and ask them to pass on with, with and without um, sign, where to pass them on to right or left person. And we, we, highlight, we use them to highlight the use of cognitive aids. Uh, calculate ongoing costs. This is where my most of the work goes right now. Faculty time and training, which is the most, I think, most expensive part of your cost. Uh, mannequin maintenance, repair, exchange of parts. I think you can make some savings here. If you have a good service contract or warranty, you can save money on mannequin maintenance. Now, we calculated our cost, and for us, um, it was cheaper to pay for odd repairs than have a service contract for three years. So we did not go for service contract. The other way of saving money is uh, a tra get your uh, technical expert training with companies, uh, higher level courses and they can make some small repairs or uh, limited repairs with mannequins with online help from the company and that saves quite a lot of money for us. Our uh, technical expert is fully trained with CAE and with ladder and they they uh, he does most of the repairs. He can swap uh, parts and everything so we we haven't spent much money on uh, maintaining mannequins now. Also take into account inflation. Money which you have today will not buy same amount of disposables in five years time. So you have to understand those things. And those financial principles, we are not taught in medicine or our post-graduation training. So these, these are things I had to learn hard way. Having a shared database helps. You have your own films, teaching films, your scenarios, school details, booking forms faculty contact, feedback forms, social media, everything is on one platform. And it really helps for other people outside to access those courses and book those courses. And it, it just it, it makes your profile better as well. Social media, I must say, is a very useful tool. I, I had to learn about Twitter since we had our Twitter um, uh, domain. 
assessment of impact. This is my current interest. And I use the Kirkpatrick ladder. So initial reaction, we have feedback forms. We have competence and confidence questionnaire, which we use pre and post course. We look at, uh, we use sometimes validated rating scales for communication teamwork or du um, duration procedures, things like that. We use that for trauma teamworking. There is a validated trauma teamwork uh, too. Uh, and patient safety benefit. Currently, we are working on uh, a big project with 33 care homes in Medway area. And we are looking at uh, uh, the hospital stay and reduction in cost per care home resident uh, following the training. And uh, we have very, in very interesting, very positive preliminary results. So what evidence nationally we have I think Dr. Sankupta has already mentioned uh, these are all uh, level three. So they have actually shown patient benefits, CVC insertion, reduction in complications, plural aspiration, uh, again, re reduction in cost, uh, complication, patient outcome benefit with cardiopulmonary arrest management. Uh, so these are really, really good evidence, strong evidence. And where do you look for those evidence? In UK, we have continuous production of uh, a meta-analysis of evidence. This one is recently published for internal medicine trainees, and they have a, a meta-analysis of all evidence available for use of simulation in internal medicine curriculum. This is a newsletter from Scotland. They review uh, papers based on uh, surgery and simulation, and they, they are regularly published. Royal College of Anesthetists has published a document. Uh, Health Education England publishes uh, evidence. So there is lots of uh, resources available. And you have to base your training on those evidence. I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I hope I've stayed in time. Thank you, Dr. Manisha, for a very, very comprehensive overview about uh, what simulation is all about. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with you when you said that uh, what you initially start about thinking and what you ultimately uh, think about uh, and get to is possibly a lot of paradigm. And with the permission of Dr. Tashi, I think, uh, shall we take the questions right at the end? Because there is going to be a lot of overlap between what uh, the faculties will talk about so i think we will take the questions i already see that some people have are starting to put in their questions so to the delegates i would say that please stay tuned in and uh, you'll hear a lot of people with huge amount of vast amount of experience in this field as dr manisha said uh, has already talked about uh, if you uh, if some things appear that is uh, that is beyond some uh, that you can't comprehend what it is it can be uh, especially to the uninitiated, at times you, uh, it, it can be that. Please put in your question, and as it is always said, there is never, never ever a stupid question. So please put in your question, and we'll wait for the questions. We will scroll through it. Dr. Tashi is there, myself, I am there. We will put it to the respected faculty at the end. So I'll now request Dr. Rakesh uh, Gurd from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, he will be taking you through the uh, the kind of gamut of uh, simulation, the modalities in simulation, and how uh, the simulators and the modalities help in medical research. And he will talk about certain innovative ideas, I'm sure, because uh, uh, Dr. Rakesh is brilliant with it. So, uh, Dr. Rakesh, all yours. Please take us through that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Saikat Sen Gupta, a good friend and senior of mine, and uh, uh, taking a good initiative. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tashi Tanjin from Bhutan, uh, because uh, he has taken a wonderful initiative for uh, his institute, because it is worth investing uh, from various uh, regions for the betterment of education uh, all across. So I think Dr. Manisha has uh, made my uh, job much easier. She has very appropriately mentioned various aspects of simulation. 
So I bring greetings from my institute where I work at. Uh, it's, it's a tertiary care center with uh, different uh, specialty centers into it. Now, what uh, Dr. Manisha has mentioned, so I'll not be repeating them again, but yes, uh, simulation is something uh, a very comprehensive learning the things. It's just not reading or just not doing the skills, but it has much more to do something, which uh, uh, just not only reflects the way you do it, but also provides you a reflection to be a part of team. You are not looking for a single outcome parameter here, but you are looking for the holistic outcome of a patient management. And that's what uh, uh, brings about uh, into the simulation conduct. And this is a process of designing a model, like in, in fact, of a real system and then taking it forward so that whatever our objectives, predefined objectives are there, we are able to complete them. Now, uh, when we say simulation, why simulation? Now, if you see the conventional practice, I think it was in India a couple of years back and maybe at some centers even today. Uh, this is more of a, a conventional part where we say that we can learn the things while we are on job. The patient comes to our clinic, we can learn on them. We can do our first bone marrow biopsy. We can learn our first intravenous needle. We can have first tracheal intubation on patients. But now when we say on job training on the patients, this is not appropriate from many regions. Maybe the quality of uh, management, maybe the patient's uh, consent, maybe that the learning exposure is not in an ethical way. So simulation is valuable when on job training is expensive or risky for whatever reasons. And that's why simulation has been adaptive for training where consequences of errors are much higher and the risk or the cost of error is much higher. For example, say, say, say air industries, they can't afford anything. So they have big simulators with them where each pilot has to spend some time to learn the things. Similarly, nuclear power plants, the same principle has been followed into medical education also. To start with, it was for uh, high risk things like, for example, a management of anaphylaxis. But then slowly and gradually, it is coming more on all aspects of the uh, medical training. Now, when we say medical training, there may be various aspects. It may be just acquisition of knowledge or maybe a simple skill. But finally, those knowledge, those skill, those experiences that we have been sharing with our students, they have finally to come into a clinical practice where a person, a physician or a surgeon or a medical professional has to actually do it on the real time patient. And before he goes for it, we need a simulation so that he not only has proper skill, but also have a proper environment where under the situation of a stressful event, he can conduct, he can do to the best possible way in a confident manner. So skills are not enough. We need to you know, chase them into some form of uh, 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 translational value into the clinical practice. We do have trust trainers that will empower us to learn a particular skill. For example, uh, Dr. Manisha mentioned, and if you see in this, if somebody wants to do a mouth to mouth uh, breathing, somebody wants to do a tracheal intubation using a fiber optic bronchoscopy, somebody wants to do a simple technique like intravenous cannulation. Now these are simple task trainers wherein we need to teach them, make them confident for the various steps of those particular tasks, which has been objectified. But then, all those tasks has to be coordinated. If you see this juggle here, now if we need an individual task, if we know an individual task, a patient comes to us, we cannot just say, okay, I have learned intravenous cannulation, so I only will do that. I do not know how to administer drugs through it. I do not know how to set up an infusion pump. So this means once we learn those individual tasks, we are expertise on them. We have to integrate each skill into the patient management as and when required in a more coordinated and a most effective manner. And this is what we need to create an environment where the person the, learns the things in a, in a more cordial section, even to start with for a task trainer. But when we say simulation, the advantages are many. It is just not for testing and teaching purpose, but it involves various aspects. It teach, it assess, it teach again. So they are integrated into the system and the assessment is done, which uh, technically if we talk of simulation, they are called Briefing and debriefing. If we have reached an, we have reached an uh, end goal. So once the end goal is achieved, 
this is what we are getting an outcome of it. A psychomotor skills, which may be technical aspect or a non-technical aspects, they need to be learned. We also provide in a simulation a decision making capacity. So this is the, a step forward after learning. So after learning the skills. So when we learn the skills, whether to do that skill on that patient or not, that decision has to be taken. And that is what the simulation comes in forward. And then the further decisions of which skill to do. A skill can be done in various ways. For example, an intravenous cannula can be, pours, can be inserted in the dorsum of hand, or at times we need a central venous cannula, a central venous catheter. So this means both will be an intravenous uh, venous access, but then we need to take decisions that which would be appropriate for those particular patients. And then we need to integrate from the individual level to the team level. So this means that when we learn an individual skill, in actual patient, whether it's an emergency department, whether it's an operation theater, or whether it's any uh, eventuality in the ward, it will be a multitude of team members, maybe physicians, maybe nursing officers, maybe technicians. They have to integrate with each other with their assigned roles so that you can have a good outcome. So what we are doing is, uh, we, 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 if we see this pyramid, this will give you a very good amount of learning or practice by doing, but then we are adding on many other things. Now, having said that, the, the uh, chance of uh, the using various simulators would be based on certain things. We talk of some, something called a fidelity, means whether it's a low fidelity simulation or a moderate or a high. So what we need to have an, a physical, a contextual and emotional realism so that a person who is involved into it can get some endpoint out of it. And this is a conglomeration of various aspects of uh, the environment, the equipment, and the psychological aspects that needs to be taken care of. Now, when we talk of simulators, now everybody of you must have uh, now played some video games on, on, on screens, even the 3D video games. So again, uh, they can be sometimes con uh, conceptual, uh, conceptualized into medical practice where you can have a screen-based simulation. For example, we have simulation for how to put up a tube inside the lungs uh, via bronchus, what we say as for one lung ventilation. So they are screen-based simulations. But then come on, uh, we have uh, some additional things to learn on, and then we proceed to task trainers where we actually can do it. And uh, these uh, task trainers will, which will make you experience into, into, the, uh, into the learning of uh, uh, various modalities of uh, uh, basic skills. But when we have learned the skills, they need to be translated into an into a environment with the teamwork. And that is what we talk of the low fidelity simulations and high fidelity simulation. I'll come a little later what does it mean and then this needs to be converted into reality. Having said that, this is one aspect. Uh, when we say the simulators, they, they may be having some expenses with them. But now on the other aspect, we at times we need uh, uh, some skill practice or simulation, but it's not always that we need to have a higher end simulators for it. We can also think of some animal models or tissues for them. Even we can have simulated patients at time, which has been trained for uh, helping us into the conduct of those simulations. And even uh, we do sometimes use the uh, human pen power who are volunteers and they are simulated for various uh, uh, type of uh, clinical experiences. And they have a real time uh, you know, mimicking of many of the aspects and the person who are participating in those simulation can learn actually. At time, sometimes it's possible for some of the things that we learn sometimes in real time uh, in situ simulation. Uh, this is, uh, I put it sometimes, a word called as teaching moments. Now, anybody who has uh, learned the basic aspects of simulation, teaching and training, one who become a faculty for it, they should always be looking for those teaching moments in the clinical practice. And there is what we need to teach our uh, residents, uh, participants, even in day-to-day -day, day -day practice. Yes, I agree. In our office, in a simulation suit, in a lab, we can teach something. But then this needs also to be translated into clinical practice. So that's why uh, Dr. Manisha was also emphasizing uh, this point that in the simulation, the faculty has to spend time. They have to learn some, some common things. And then they have to 
uh, make other people learn. But then even those faculty, because those participants may be with them into a clinical practice, they also be looking for you know, emphasizing or teaching or at times it may, it may be a some time of simulation in a real time practice also so that the participants can learn. So this is what I uh, termed as sequential simulation wherein you teach them task training, you put them into a lab where you can have some type of uh, uh, simulated environment and then you clinically translate into a clinical practice so that the person who you are teaching becomes expert into it. We started with a small mannequin, if you remember everybody in 1960s, and then we uh, went to an, a little advanced mannequins. We had more robust mannequins. Then uh, there was some more interaction, more modules were put into it. And this is how we have uh, come up uh, into more advanced type of mannequins, which has allowed us to learn the things. But now even if you take this part, even the cadavers, maybe the human or the animal are also a helping hand, cost effective and they provide a real time you know, a feel of learning a skill and then we can translate them into a virtual reality once they have learned from different sources. Now, when we say the high fidelity simulation, now here, what I mean by high fidelity simulation is this type of simulation environment is created by uh, various uh, equipments, the uses of the IT inputs, and then there will be some other things like uh, briefing and debriefing. So, the simulators are able to react to the learner's intervention. So for example, say if patient is having bradycardia, if you give them atropine, the heart rate will start rising. If somebody has an airway obstruction, you do a chin lift, patient will start breathing. So this means there is some realism to the scenario and the learners are challenged to apply the correct intervention. If airway obstruction, if they don't do a heart tilt and chin lift, probably the airway will remain closed, patient will get hypoxic and can cardiac arrest. So this means uh, that type of, uh, uh, the environment can be created and the scenario can be changed as according to the intervention done by the learners. It replicates the patient care demand as close to as what the learners would practice. For example, a bronchospasm, for example, uh, some amount of uh, gurgling sound. So these will, be, uh, these will be simulators wherein you can mimic all those things. You can mimic the hemodynamic parameters. You can do interventions on them. And uh, you know, for example, say tension pneumothorax, if you put up a needle there, there will be some gush of sound come out. So and patient will have improvement in the hemodynamic and respiratory component. If you go a little down, they will be having a more of a, a little lesser realistic, but they lack many cues necessary for participants to completely immerse themselves. But at this point of time, as Dr. Manisha was also mentioning, that the faculty should be trained that what cues can be generated into your simulator or a mannequin or a task trainer and what you need to mimic or you need to make them pre-informed so that they, they are comfortable with. And obviously, if you come from uh, uh, low versus high fidelity, the concerns are with regards to uh, the cognitive overload, the learning outcomes and the impression. So this needs to be you know, understood that the various type of simulators, you can create simulation with the task trainer and also with a high fidelity simulator, but you need to learn, you need to understand as a faculty that what are learning outcomes from that particular scenario? what information you want to give to the participants, how much participants should be immersed into that scenario. So once you understand this, you can create simulation with whatever you have. You can start with a normal human volunteer as a simulation, or you can go for a high fidelity simulator. So this is what I just put my slides into understanding where we say that on one side, we want to create a fidelity. On other side, we have a technology. So depending upon what you want, a high fidelity, high technology, obviously the cost factor will be much higher, but yes, it will be more of a realistic. Low fidelity, low technology, it will be very cheap, but you will be able to not create a realistic. The faculty role will be much, much more important here. So this means the choice of simulator technology is as per the desired outcome. You have to look for that, what is my outcome for this particular scenario. And based on this, you can look for what type of simulator or what type of simulation technique you have to create. 
develop the appropriate level of summation fidelity around the simulator depending upon your outcome. So this is what I have tried to put it that in case of a low fidelity simulator, the equipment fidelity is uh, is maybe high, but then it, it increases to the other factors like environmental, psychological, and that is what we are looking for the high fidelity scenario. But again, a good clinical simulated faculty will be required for generating this type of simulator. So this is a normal uh, uh, porcine uh, skin, which we have used for incision and drainage. And if you see, these are the human volunteers, right? And they have just used uh, uh, the uses of the various color and clays to create a stab wound here, right? So these are the various uh, simulation uh, things uh, we have been doing. So this is not maybe a very high uh, fidelity simulators, but we tend to create an environment wherein the person can learn. So this all depends upon your endpoint, what you want to learn. Now, this was a simulation being created for trauma victim, initial management, initial primary assessment management, which we could, which we could do in a simple mannequin and we can translate or we can you know, project the various hemodynamics on the screen as well. Oh dear. So this is how we are directly recording them. So this is uh, one of the basic simulation, right? So this is how, uh, if you th if you think about, uh, uh, depending upon the need, uh, using s some amount of even the trust trainers, when can we can create uh, some amount of uh, uh, scenario here, some amount of simulation here, so that they can learn some basic aspects of the uh, uh, clinical management. But remember, sometimes we need a sophisticated as. Uh, 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 previous speaker was also mentioned wherein we can create a simulated operation theater or a simulated emergency department or even a ward where we can give them a particular script a particular case scenario and they need to manage it but then if you see that simulation control room uh, expert faculty will look for what they are doing good and what they are not doing so good so that the debriefing can be done appropriately now uh, as a faculty we need to understand the uh, basic uh, concept of simulator setting now, it's not simple. I think uh, it requires a lot of understanding when we want to uh, teach simulation somebody. It is not difficult, believe me. Uh, everybody of us can learn it and teach others, but it requires a little bit of dedication because it's more of a dynamic phenomena. Your one written script for any uh, simulation will not work for all the groups. So you have to be very, very dynamic. There will be a repeated loops. You have to go back. There will be integrated modules depending upon what your outcome from that particular clinical scenario is. So based on this, you have to you know, go back and come forward and come forth for briefing and debriefing so that whatever your objective is, you are able to give that. As a preparation, I think Dr. Manisha has done it very nicely, but uh, we need to have a manpower and uh, which is uh, simulation training, our trained faculty should be there who should have a very clear concept of simulation and concept of various clinical scenarios, briefing and debriefing. They need to practice themselves and rehearse so that they can understand. And finally, there should be some quality standards monitoring. And then we can have infrastructural things, uh, which may be equipment or simulation rooms. Uh, it all depends upon uh, what, particular uh, a clinical scenario you want to simulate. And based on this, the equipment can vary. But yes, obviously, as I just showed you, uh, even the human volunteers can very, very nicely, uh, uh, with minimal training, can work for a real-time uh, simulator for us. And they are very, very cost-effective. So to summarize, uh, simulation-based learning remains need for the day now because we cannot teach uh, every person on, on real-time in patients because of ethical reasons. They can be done from simple objects to the use of high fidelity simulators. So nothing to worry that we always need a very high end, fidelity, uh, high end simulators for teaching a, a scenario. We can even have simple objects, even human volunteers that can be good for uh, teaching those simulations. A progressive continuum from low fidelity simulation to high fidelity also depends upon the level of training. So maybe we can start with the very low fidelity simulators to teach them basic skills, understanding team concepts. And then as they progress further on, the training progresses further on, we can make them more proficient in clinical skill and then can uh, make them their understand or conceptualization of a clinical case management based on the uh, high end fidelities. There is highly entertaining. It's really enjoyable. I say uh, simulation teaching is really enjoyable and we should make it enjoyable for our participants also. And it has a lot of positive emotional experience because they can learn those uh, uh, stress 
they can learn those uh, uh, no panicky situations and that's why it's, it's really good to have a real time experience of it but remember that sometimes uh, uh, teaching the participants on simulators can sometimes make them overconfident especially when you are using a high fidelity simulator because um, uh, uh, everything will not be able to mimic there will be some uh, real time uh, absence of a real patient in their mind at the back of their mind so at time they become overconfident so it becomes the uh, faculty understanding of simulation so that they can give a real time image of that particular simulation to the patient thank you so much and uh, uh, back to dr uh, sekhar sen gupta uh, thank you dr rakesh i think uh, as always uh, very very lucid and uh, beautiful presentation to take us through the various aspects uh, of actually what a simulator is what the types of simulators here the level different levels and i think uh, as dr rakesh has uh, as dr yeah i think uh, one of the uh, fundamental tenets of making a, a successful simulation program for teaching is uh, is you know writing the script and uh, that is where the faculty plays such a huge role over whatever the simulator is there whether it is low fidelity or high fidelity so and uh, the faculty needs to be aware as to you want the delegates to go through and i think this will come it doesn't come in one day it, it takes time it, uh, you uh, re do it repeatedly you uh, yourself uh, uh, remain willing that i am i am I, I am there to also teach myself and uh, maybe do it a different way the next time around so that that amount of plasticity within ourselves is also very very important so thank you i think please do put in your uh, queries onto the chat box we'll find we'll take them up uh, at the end and finally i would now ask uh, dr rahul uh, dr rahul shortkar who is also from the nhs uh, nhs foundation medwet um, medwet foundation trust sorry about that rahul uh, and he will take us through uh, the how simulation and how the teaching and training with the simulator helps in this interpersonal skills communication skills and i think you also uh, delve a lot about uh, what how uh, important debriefing is about simulation uh, all your dr just like can you put the slides up please Hi, this is Dr. Sarkar. Uh, I uh, grew up in Kolkata and uh, trained there uh, too, and did all of my post graduation uh, in the UK. So I do know how uh, generally the system works in the Indian subcontinent, and I've got lots of friends. I'm regularly in touch with lots of uh, doctors uh, and patients as well. So it's a great uh, privilege to uh, be talk. Uh, talk to you about uh, the role of simulation in clinical uh, medicine uh, i must say that I'll, I'll, i got uh, exposed to this in the last 10 or 12 years and the initial experience was uh, a bit bumpy and I, I, I like everyone else felt somewhat anxious to be part of the uh, to to train through simulation but eventually i uh, developed a huge love for this mode of uh, uh, education delivery and i'll i'll explain why why that happens uh, we have uh, moved away to some extent in the in the last couple of decades uh, from a very individual uh, based uh, based clinical delivery to a team based in clinical delivery it's not about you you have the best doctor treating you and you get better it doesn't work like that people now know that to to get a patient better better in a safe way you don't you don't only need a doctor you need a good team team of nurses team of pharmacists physiotherapists and and everyone around that patient and then only yeah, the patient gets better and uh, we know that uh, that you are as strong as your weakest link so uh, what is what is a team team is obviously individuals coming together to achieve a common goal and um, therefore we need to make sure that 
every individual is well trained, but also that the team itself is well trained as well. We do see that you know you have you have the best midfielder in the in the team, but uh, they have dribbled and dodged quite a few defenders, but forgot to uh, pass the ball to the striker at the right time. Therefore, the goal cannot be scored. And uh, it was uh, mentioned about one of the very famous teams uh, a few years ago, Arsenal, that their team game was really going downhill and therefore uh, the results were not that good. Therefore, this is everywhere in, in clinical medicine, in, uh, in sports and uh, any other walks of life, the team has to uh, work jointly. Now, how do we achieve that? How do we achieve that everyone works together? And you know you can you can teach a footballer all the skills individually, but he has to practice it with his teammates. But it's not only good enough to practice with teammates. He has to do that sometimes in a very real life match scenario. So therefore, they play practice matches and they play in various drills where they 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 make some moves and they have got defenders on the other side and then they practice that particular move many many times so that when it comes to the actual game. They can perform very well, and I think that's exactly what is the role of of clinical simulation in, in general as well. Now, uh, you know, I just say telling you about the, you know even the best doctor's management plan may, may fail if the pharmacy forgot to order the order the drug. It happens. It happens in all uh, healthcare systems. Now, I'll, what I'll do is um, I, and and generally the other point that I was trying to make is that. You know, we do fail sometimes in our day-to-day -day works, in our attention, perception, memory, and knowledge. And uh, uh, Atul Gawande, a very highly regarded surgeon from Harvard who writes a lot in these matters, he actually recently said, uh, one or two years ago, that, uh, well, for the players to have coaches, why don't we have coaches? Why don't we practice under the supervision of someone regularly? I might be the one of the best surgeons in the world, but why do I assume that I will be keeping that performance level all, all through my life. So if you can say that, I think we all can say the same as well, that we all need to re revisit our skill level, we need to revisit our team performing skills regularly. And uh, what it does, what by practicing through simulation, by educating through simulation, what happens is we understand our own strengths and weaknesses, which is very important. Uh, as we have seen before by Dr. Garg and uh, Dr. Uh, Shah, is that reflection is a huge part of learning. So uh, lots of cognitive bi biases are there, so I'm not going to uh, enlist them fully. It's what we do address by doing lots of simulation uh, maneuvers and practices and drills is, uh, is for example, you know, anchoring or is, is a huge problem sometimes. Say, for example, we have a patient in ICU and uh, he is on ventilator, he is on noradrenaline and so on. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, uh, he st starts to drop his blood pressure. And then what happens is he's septic, he's, he's got pneumonia. And uh, people think, well, he has, he's got more septic. So just increase his noradrenaline. But, and that's the most easiest thing to do. However, what, what might be happening underneath his sheet is that he might be having a huge melina which has been missed for the last half an hour and therefore all he, he what he needs is a uh, blood transfusion and make sure he gets the most of and someone stops the bleeding so anchoring to what is available to him immediately, immediately happens in real life and we need to if we can practice these things as, or educate ourselves about this through high fidelity then it's less likely that that will happen in a real life patient. And similarly, we we have a huge uh, debate at the moment about how we transfer patients, how we hand over patients. Say a, a patient comes from emergency department to ICU, and there, there is a handover that takes place. There is a huge chance that a lot of information will be uh, dropped uh, during that process, and uh, um, an antibiotic which is supposed to be given to the patient in the next half an hour, and uh, then the nurse forgets to tell the ICU nurse and therefore that antibiotic is missed and the sepsis gets worse and these can be practiced as well and similarly availability bias say for example you taught someone about anaphylaxis today and they have a patient who is hugely wheezy or a chest full of bronchi bilaterally comes to him next day and there's a chance that he might think of anaphylaxis first instead of the wheezy thing which is asthma so all of this can be addressed and, and uh, what I'll do now, I, I, I will give you two or three examples of how 
and why uh, simulation can be really useful in real life scenario and taking examples from uh, incidents that happened uh, that uh, some are quite widely uh, publicized and some which we have used in our hospital. So this is a story of a young uh, woman who has been intubated for a routine surgery by two senior anesthetists. And then uh, there were assistants around and those two senior anesthetists got uh, into trouble intubating her and they carried on uh, trying without realizing that the oxygen is dropping and they, when they have eventually intubated uh, after 20-25 minutes uh, the, the, there has been hypoxic uh, brain injury and this is a widely publicized case uh, in the UK and in all sorts of teaching events this is, uh, this is uh, addressed and these sort of scenarios can be made up in the simulation lab and the team can practice so that the task fixation doesn't happen so that the assistants, the in, in fact, some of these assistants were looking at the monitor and knew that the oxygen was dropping and they didn't have the courage to tell the senior anesthetists that look, the oxygen is dropping, do something else, ask for help or do something different. And so all of these behavioral things can be practiced so that that sort of disastrous um, outcome doesn't happen for uh, subsequent patients. Now, um, in, whilst we uh, include uh, various different learner groups we have to put all of these people in the in various groups and in the subsequent two cases i'll i'll show how we have used simulation to incorporate all of these groups into as a team to uh, make sure everyone is on the same page say uh, i'll just drop a couple of these to uh, go ahead say a story of chest pain what happened there was a patient who, who had a chest pain insertion and this is real life again, a chest drain insertion in, say, in the mid-afternoon. In the night shift, he starts to get unwell and he is um, hypoxemic. And then the very junior resident just out of medical school was called to see the patient. And uh, it took her some time to realize that the, the chest drain underneath the dressing is slightly dislodged. And uh, then about 15 minutes later, she called for help and the other people arrived. The patient was taken to ICU, eventually had to be intubated, actually. He survived and outcome was good. But then what we, we identified that the fresh out of school medical graduates are not very, very uh, competent in understanding the chest drain circuit. And therefore, we designed a simulation scenario exactly on the basis of this story and then made a video and showed each and every uh, medical graduate uh, who is just out of medical school coming to our hospital that this is how it works and then ran this scenario on them and not probably very surprisingly a majority of them did not know how a chest brain circuit works therefore to by picking up a real life scenario and teaching uh, exactly similar scenario seniority people we ensured that similar sort of things do not happen again and they felt confident to uh, manage a patient like that in future, which we found from the feedbacks. So this is a very junior doctor cohort, and we included a nurse and a senior medical registrar in the scenarios as well. And we made sure, first of all, they knew how the chest drain works, they knew what the circuit is, and they knew when to call for help if they're not they're struggling, not to be task fix fixated, ask for help as soon as possible to get, keep the patient safe. Uh, similarly, um, this is a story of a tracheostomy. Um, this is actually uh, my own experience. So one, uh, we, I had a patient with tracheostomy in ICU who was uh, desaturating and we found that the, there, was, there was a problem with the tube. It was totally blocked. And uh, it was happening very quickly. And uh, I, in the heat of the moment, a very senior nurse um, uh, put a mask on the top of the face and started bagging. And I realized that whilst he was trying to do that, the cuff, the tracheostomic cuff was still inflated and therefore there was no airway. So the first thing would be to obviously deflate the cuff and then back. So that, that's a, a lot of people may not understand that in this audience, but essentially you need uh, the cuff to be deflated and then you um, uh, bag. And that's a very basic thing that we need to ensure. So I, I, I seen that. And then I took that out in the simulation lab and we made uh, quite a few sessions for ICU nurses and ICU doctors. Again, 
exactly the same learning outcome that they all they need to know is how to manage a block tracheostomy and they must take home this message that if they're bagging from the face they deflect the cup without this it doesn't work and again not not so surprisingly a lot of nurses did remember that but when you run the scenario about 20 to 25 percent would forget that uh, that particular aspect and therefore it is uh, what we gain from that session or those sessions is that that doesn't repeat again and we because we took the incident from the uh, real life from the unit like dr Berg says there, it was a teaching moment for the whole team in a way because then they knew about the incident then they can relate to that and they were ready to learn and take home that message so this is how also it can be used uh, this real life incidents can be simulated in the simulation lab and used for for the team and a task fixation is a huge problem say so for example following these these sessions we uh, ran in the next month or so we ran another uh, session but this time what we did was uh, with the tracheostomy tube uh, being there actually the patient the simulated patient was going worse not because of the tube but because of attention pneumothorax. But because we have run, run the sim simulation about the tracheostomy, a lot of people were initially thinking that it's tracheostomy, but actually the attention pneumothorax. And then again, we said that we need to have a situational awareness, go through the steps in a methodical way. And from that session, what they took was that we need to follow the process and not have a very fixed idea about what's going wrong. And therefore, you we can bring all the team on there were uh, juniors, then senior registrars, um, uh, and then senior and junior nurses and physiotherapists involved. And everyone then goes back to the unit with the same message in their mind that this is how we should organize ourselves in managing a uh, sick patient. And so, in these uh, stories, we were building up awareness within the team, building up the team based skills. And uh, in, in the in the subsequent scenario, the last one that I'm going to talk about, you know, you can test the organization, the hospital as well, by simulating. What, what we did before the pandemic was starting in February, we, uh, we felt that something big is coming. And we are not sure that we are all ready to uh, encounter that. Uh, because there are lots of issues with, um, uh, with, with infection control, uh, risk to people, etc. So we made a simulation as if a patient with very high suspected COVID-19 was brought in by an ambulance to the emergency department. And then what happens after that? The patient in the next hour starts to go worse and how the team then responds. By, by team, I mean the, the emergency team, doctors, nurses, the anesthetic team who will intubate, the intensive care team, the radiology team, and the, the manager on call who will have his first patient and how they respond to that. And then we ran the same scenario for a while and uh, obviously lots of things didn't go fully well, which is the whole idea of doing it. And we learned quite a few things. Uh, some of the things you would not realize before you actually do it. And for example, we found that the room was too small, uh, where initially the plan was to take the first patient into emergency. And quite surprisingly, radiographer was not tested for mask fit. And therefore, when we asked for a chest x-ray, that was difficult to achieve uh, immediately. So, and then part of the intubation team was unsure about the protocol, how to keep themselves safe and, and do it. And there was fear all around. And there was a lack of clarity. But the good thing was that we did it well within time before our first patient came like that. Therefore, we implement, implemented all the changes that we learned from this uh, incident. And then when the patients start to come, we are better prepared. We can't say about that we are perfect, but we are much better prepared for the, the scenario. If we, if we didn't do it, we will be totally uh, unprepared on, with the first patient. Therefore, these, these drills, these uh, cognitive processes, the preparedness for the individual, for the smaller team, for the bigger team, for the whole hospital, can really be achieved well with uh, with this, uh, with simulation. You won't uh, think of sending a football team to the Premier League just by uh, uh, teaching them some dribbles and dodges and uh, some tackles. The, you will you will give them the whole experience of being in a team. 
and then before the season begins, you will send them to say play some practice matches. Without that, you will not start the start the season. So why should we, who are dealing with human lives, allow ourselves to be treating patients without going to the whole bunch of practice and preparedness? And simulation can do that. Um, and uh, uh, this last uh, bit is really important. I think Dr. Shah was trying to mention this. Emergency cesarean section uh, was was practice someone who comes into emergency and they really need to uh, be uh, have a cesarean section and eventually what was fine the part of uh, emergency that they landed there was not an immediately available uh, scalpel that could do the c-section uh, but fortunately it was a mannequin and therefore uh, all those equipments was put into that particular portion and therefore when the actual patient arrives it is safe and uh, therefore there's a wide variety of things that we can do with uh, with simulation i just try to put some ex ex examples and obviously we can from low fidelity like has been discussed before we can get better at individual tasks and get better at routine tasks um, like central line insertion cannula blood gases and so on or surgical techniques but high fidelity is is to get better as team identify and address cognitive biases do a word round simulation and we, we can find that we have forgotten to maybe prescribe uh, a, a drug which is really important for example heparin and next day the patient gets uh, a dvd and d if we follow a checklist we, the patient doesn't have it and there's a system to, through high fidelity as well so that's the that's what i wanted to say and i wanted to finish with um, i wanted to finish with this uh, Example, this is the, I don't know if a lot of people would recognize this. Um, if, if it was a face to face, I'll ask people if they do recognize this. But if people who follow uh, various different uh, football uh, competitions, they, they will be able to remember probably that it's the Greece uh, team, football team of Greece, and um, they became champion in the year 2000. They were European champions. They were 23rd out of 32 uh, teams in the competition, but they were champions uh, in that year. And they did that by sheer teamwork. They followed the same principle towards the team goal, and they were the champions. They, they, they beat Portugal 1 0 in the final. And again, what we can achieve through simulation again, that we deliver as a team and we can achieve the very best. No matter what team we have got, we can we can have a world class outcome, and that's the point I try to make. With that, uh, I will finish. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rahul, for a, a wonderful uh, deliberation and taking us through the role of simulation in the non-cognitive areas as well, and uh, and the role of teamwork which comes huge in uh, clinical practice and how simulation can help us uh, in that regard. And uh, of course, I, I am in love with somebody who draws the analogy of football to anything. And uh, Rakesh is smiling because he knows about this. Uh, one of my favorite talks that I do is uh, how sports helps us to become a better anesthesiologist. Yeah, I do remember that uh, European Championship when uh, uh, Greece came in as a wild card entry. When I think uh, one of the Scandinavian countries dropped out and they went then went on to win the championship. And uh, this is what I think simulation can do. Uh, uh, it can prepare you for an uh, unprepared kind of a thing. And the closest example that I quote to my residents is uh, malignant hyperthermia. Touch your fingers crossed. You don't get to see one. But uh, this is the only place that you possibly can run a, a malignant hyperthermia drill uh, so that it prepares you when uh, it actually hits you. And touch wood that it doesn't hit you. But if it does, at least this can prepare you for that. Anik, I will start taking uh, one of the, a few of the questions. And I would ask any one of you to uh, take it up. Is that OK, Dr. Tashi? That's how we do it? Yes, yes uh, correct. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Kupton uh, uh, has asked is uh, how the emotional component is taken care of in simulated training. I think uh, it is, again, it is about uh, the, uh, the non-technical areas which 
can come in and uh, you see one of the things that many people in their initial days uh, tried to do in a simulated scenario and you don't need a huge uh, simulator to do it is uh, uh, simulating breaking bad news uh, for an intensive care or uh, how to consent uh, the simulated scenario for a, a difficult surgery and i think this is where the emotional uh, component comes in in a big big way this is what i feel and uh, about the effective domain that somebody else has asked uh, i think uh, if people who uh, constantly ended up in manisha would uh, possibly talk on this uh, is that when you take the students through a simulated scenario and if the scenario ends up with a bad result you find a lot of these people who have gone through this uh, situation actually not feeling good about the whole thing and they then they'll tell you that uh, well we, we could have done this and done that after the debriefing they feel that uh, mm, uh, uh, they 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 do get what i'm trying to get to is they do get affected mentally uh, dr manisha any words on this about the emotional component and the effective domain in simulation training yes i think i agree with you uh it is uh, the faculty's responsibility to create that safe environment for learning and for the psychological safety of the participants when we started simulation initially we had a rule that we did not have a negative outcome because we were running for very junior uh, uh, junior uh, staff like multidisciplinary simulation for medical students and nursing students or foundation trainees with junior nurses and we always had a get out clause so if a scenario so that they, they did something very unusual we would send a faculty in in some disguise to to make that scenario right or give them some clues or a phone call to make that decision better so we always had that get out clause now we are becoming slightly more braver with much more experienced faculty where we do have negative outcome but we run those scenarios in two parts so you have a negative outcome you have management and then discussion breaking that bad news to relatives so if we run that in context of that previous scenario and uh, there is other aspect as well the um, what about if trainee does extremely badly in the simulation how what would you do um as uh, our guidance is, uh, um, uh, our overarching guidance is it's leads or uh, faculty's responsibility if there is a patient safety issue so then we have to take the training out and have we do a separate feedback and separate debrief uh if this issue is which we cannot resolve through simulation or a little bit more training that it is highlighted to trainees or education supervisor or so the, the the doctor who is directly responsible for training of for of this training and uh, sometimes uh, there has been one case where trainee did so badly in simulation and we had a separate debrief and separate feedback but at the end that that simulation gave trainee um uh, time to reflect and actually trainee decided to leave medicine the simulation was the point where trainee realized that medicine is not for 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 him yeah. as a career thank you thank you dr manisha i think that's absolutely well put it is uh, it is a much safer way instead of having a bad outcome on a patient and i keep harping on this that if, if there is a bad outcome during a scenario uh, you can correct and even the effective component would be lesser on the training and i think again it is classic a good teacher is somebody who even teaches a bad situation and uh, does not make that uh, student feel worse about it i think that is what i think fundamentally it is up to the person the faculty is such a, such a huge role i then i'll come up to the next question and ask rakesh to take a call on this uh, is about pricing uh, as we know that it can range between indian rupees 50 lakhs to 10 crores or 50 crores as well uh, but uh, is there any 
uh, like for me, there's a, a question from Dr. Yuriko. Uh, success for the institutional how uh, high frequency simulation labs can be set up. Any example of digital tools which are affordable applications or softwares which can enhance the simulation-based training? Uh, any online teaching learning platform uh, where they can, uh, uh, I think Dr. Tashi can take a lead on this as well as to guide and to, I think, uh, I think he's talking about acquisition and uh, installation and stuff like that. I think uh, this is a very important question for those, uh, especially like Dr. Uh, Tashi, who is uh, leading the institute, uh, how to take an initiative for uh, setting up a uh, simulation center. Now, the first important thing would be that what is your endpoint or what are all your objectives for uh, setting this simulation? Because simulation does not have any endpoint, right? It can be as simple as a simple. Uh, uh, ED management of an airway, which will not take uh, a couple of thousand rupees to be, it could be as sophisticated as a simulation center for doing neurosurgical interventions like gamma knife, right? So if you go to that end of the simulation, it will be uh, um, uh, somewhere uh, crossing say uh, 1000 road rupees for setting up a DAT simulation center. So my concern is uh, any institute which is uh, going to get a simulation center they need to have a concept that what they are going to teach into it. And accordingly, there will be a list of task trainers, part-time trainers and simulators that needs to be listed. Now, uh, he said that from where to uh, uh, go about those things. Now, when you try to look for those things, there are a couple of uh, uh, people in the market who are doing this work. So they are doing both the things. They are not only providing the mannequins, like for example, say Lerdell, who, who, who is one of the leader, even uh, Philips people have some of the simulators and even the local uh, manufacturers have something like from India, some of the local manufacturers have also started, even Ambu has also started. So there are a couple of global leaders who have a good experience, but taking their expertise obviously will be again costly because their advisory cost will also add to it. And then it all depends upon what type of equipment you are purchasing from them. So if I say, uh, if, I, if, I, if to start with, I think uh, the first step should be the basic simulation center uh, in which uh, probably there will be a simulation lab, which will be as Dr. Manisha was mentioning. Now in today's day, we cannot have one room separate for each type of simulation. So we cannot have our airway management and OT and IED. Now they are more of a modular and flexible uh, rooms that we can all make. The part-time the part trainers and the task trainers can be shifted in and out. So they are uh, uh, foldable uh, 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 things are available. So that is uh, we need to think of and then have an point that for say next, next one year, uh, this is our budget, this is what we want. So this will be our budget. And then we can expand on because when you're looking for a very high end simulators, it is actually if I put it um, uh, my brain and heart into it, it's not the simulator that teaches. It's not the simulator that will uh, uh, bring about those uh, psychological, emotional effect, effect, everything we are talking about. This is not the simulator will bring our sim simulator can only mimic sounds of gurgling. They can bring the bronchospasm, the BB can fall, but finally it's the faculty who will be doing it. So sometimes, uh, as I mentioned uh, in my session, something called a teaching moment. So when I taking round with my residents and sometimes some patient has something, I just try to mimic it, right? Okay, I said, okay, if it happens, what, what will you do? So I create a simulation scenario on my rounds at times or say anaphylaxis, right? And they say, okay, what's the, what is the first step you will do for it, right? So what is the first drug? Go and get it. I'll just create a simulation. I'm not going to test the patient. Patient is not being harmed. If you get me an adrenaline and a crash card, I'm happy that he is right with it, right? So I've done nothing that is absolutely real time. That is on my rounds in IC rounds. And just, just create a scenario. I'm the team leader. I don't allow anybody to test the patient. So the patient is not harmed. So this means you can create those teaching moments at any point of time. So I think uh, uh, the simulation can start at no cost, zero cost, as I sometimes do on my rounds, or it can cost you crores. But just remember, it's not the financial uh, investment into it, but the first step should be the proper training of the faculty. And simulation can be 
create it at any place. So I think uh, you can just make a small mannequin of 10,000 rupees and, and can do a lot of simulation. I sometimes uh, put uh, uh, balloons, sometimes my Anasia machine bags into it, I attach it. So I think those are, those are uh, all vistas from my operation theater and try to use them. So I think uh, cost rupees zero to unlimited. Faculty training, must. Out of the box thinking, innovation, must. And that out of the box thinking and innovation only comes when some simulation teaching. Because as Manisha was also saying, I also agree. Sometimes when we uh, invite my colleagues to come up and help me in simulation, they say, yeah, you go there and sit and have a cup of tea and chit chat. And then you say, you have done right, you have done wrong, you have done right. So do it next time and the simulation is over. I said, no, this is a full time work because you have to observe each and every aspect of each person who are involved into the simulation drill. Make a point, then do a debrief, understand them, not only by the outcome that the patient has revived with cardiac arrest and he is having a return of spontaneous circulation, but how they have done it, the after effect of those things. So this is what needs to be done. So I think cost is very variable, but uh, it's doable. We have to take a first step and then we can expand it. I think I, I would kind of sum up and uh, kind of say to Dr. Tashi before he makes his concluding remarks. I think Rakesh, we just lost you for a brief moment. I'll just sum up. Uh, as everybody has kind of mentioned, I think you, uh, I think uh, the way to start would be to think that what are your goals at the end of say one year, three years, and five years, and figure out what your budgetary allocations are, and then possibly plan it that way. Huge is who are the people who would be really interested in taking this up. And as uh, all of us are kind of at in the same uh, room on this, is that uh, that you need dedicated people to take this up. Uh, the the cost is as uh, Rakesh has repeatedly been saying is uh, is it's over here. So it is a, more about the script that you write the program that you run, and finally is uh, how you do the debrief, debriefing. And for that, uh, it, 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 that is how much of the time that you have as he, everyone, uh, Dr. Manisha, Dr. Rahul, Dr. Uh, Rakesh has been saying, is your willingness to think out of the box, your willingness to uh, kind of modulate as the uh, simulated pathway is taking, and to kind of at times, as you, everybody was there, you need to break in and possibly say that it is going a completely different thing than what you would have thought of the plan B, plan C as well. So you need uh, to be flexible about that. I think uh, I would say that Dr. Karki, please uh, go ahead. You seem to be having that burning desire. Uh, I think it, it, it's there. You just plan it out. We are there to help. Uh, Dr. Rakesh is there. Dr. Manisha is there. Thank Dr. Rahul. So all of us uh, are there. So if you have anything else, because I can't see any more questions coming up in the chat box. So you, if you can make your concluding remarks, and then I'll finally ask Shudeshna to uh, take the, take us through the process for the delegates as to how they can put in their feedbacks uh, uh, by responding to the email and how they can uh, possibly also look into the entire session later on. and. Uh, there is also the a certificate of participation for the delegates, which they will receive at the end. So, Dr. Tashi, uh, your concluding remarks on this? Oh uh, yeah, thank you. With uh, some uh, trouble with my with my audio and network, but then I think I really enjoyed uh, those uh, parts. Uh, this. Uh, for many of our faculties, it's actually been considered that the simulation is maybe a simulation will take a part of the faculties and then maybe faculties will take more rest. But I think from today's uh, talk, probably I think our faculties, many of them who, who attended would understand that their yes, simulation is a part of a learn and uh, this is part of a faculty at the same time part of a team. So. Hopefully, we'll be able to discuss further on this while we are discussing about what type of simulators we should buy, 
what uh, for example dr rakesh mentioned about what is our end point it's uh, the basic uh, to advance one and what are mostly available in indian markets which are very close by so that uh, for doing for maintaining for uh, after service and this will be much easier to have some brands which are easily available in indian supply will be easier to contact our friends in india will be easier to get the help from for example dr rakesh and uh, dr saikar your expertise where what sort of uh, brands you are using you will be most comfortable to work with us when you come to us and uh, like professor kaur who is working in sats and uh, probably we will go by uh, some sort of things and simulators and programs which we you have been successful so that will be sharing your expertise so uh, no, with this i think it was really really uh, a learning stage for most of us and it's even for myself you have taken dr manisha and uh, and dr rahul prakash and leading led by i think uh, professor saikar i think this was a complete package to for us to actually know the how what when and what is required to set up a simulator simulation lab i think probably uh, chief of uh, jaika uh, mr uh, mr uh, watanabe probably i remember him getting registered there probably he must be listening also he is not a not, he is not a medical person but he is really uh, working to help us uh, set up the simulation lab and then i think he might have been benefited listening to your talk and maybe he will guide us and we will be able to discuss further it will be much easier for for us to discuss and with the only aim is to enhance uh, medical education but maintaining patient safety but at the same time to maintain and do at a cost which is affordable by bhutan you know we don't have money we don't we cannot even uh by the uh, by the substitutes if we set up a very high fidelity and then if they broke down and we need to get uh, the substitutes from far flung so we need to consider all the components and which you four of you have highlighted is the most useful for us so i think uh with this uh, which we have spent a lot of time although we wanted to just do it for one hour to 90 minutes but we have overshot this is passion about having the simulators i mean the people behind the simulator is not the simulator but the men behind the simulators and four of you have really done a wonderful job and it's just the beginning and we will be seeking help from aims will be seeking help from apollo down there uh, our patients are going down to kolkata most of our patients are treated there and we have the closest of friends in india and i think uh, this will be this will be just the best of friendship to keep uh, our uh, collaboration working on sir so i really look forward and my university will be looking forward it's not just the post graduate we have a uh, nurses we have a allied group we have uh, physicians so this will be a whole package that will be looking forward so since today is just the introductory hopefully sudeshna will probably write to you and we i'll be writing to you to get more help because some of the questions that need to be clarified more and probably we will conduct a specialized and short uh, webinars uh, subsequently so with this i'd like to thank my uh, bosses here my colleagues friends in bhutan and also uh, organizing this uh, i think set team has done a wonderful job and uh, he had she the, the set team sudeshna before that there was jayati the the set team had really picked up the cream of this simulation lab and uh, it's been most useful for us to now build up and move from here for next 5 years what is our end point and what we are looking forward so when the covid settles down i think uh, professor saikat and Dr. Rakesh will be able to join us, and when we actually launch our simulation lab, we'll be happy to have you here and spend some time, enjoy the beauty of the mountains, and also 
we'll create some scenario with when you are here. So with this, I'd uh, like to thank uh, four of you and the uh, SATS team for organizing this and all my friends and uh, colleagues and my honorable president here. So thank you so much with this. Uh, have a nice evening for you all. Uh, keep safe and uh, let's hope that uh, uh, COVID we can all unitedly help and uh, regain our uh, sort of peace and harmony and uh, and uh, control this uh, COVID. Let the winter come, but let's fight together and uh, let the simulators work and uh, maybe one day we'll all be together and rejoicing sitting face to face. So thank you, uh, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, delegate. Just uh, just remember the website, edu.hcp forum. Edu.hcp forum. This is for the delegates. So uh, the entire recorded version will be available there. Hope to see you soon. Stay safe and uh, be brave. And bye-bye. Thank you for bye -bye. joining in. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.